Hello everybody, my name is Charlie Martin. If you're just checking in with us for the first time, pastor here at Bethel Baptist Church in beautiful Vilas, North Carolina. And it's just been a beautiful week here in the neighborhood. And so glad that you could join in with us tonight. First of all, let me encourage you, uh, if you're aware you uh, have a Bible handy, if you could get your Bible, we're going to be picking up where we kind of left off last week and on the, we're, we're talking about prayer right now, one of the key components of our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and, and our relationship with God. And uh, so while you're getting your Bibles ready, I just want to say a couple of things relating to our, our people from the Bethel Aryan community. We are really excited this week because we're in a building program we have been in for a good while now and will be in for several more months. And we're having our service uh, out in the park because of the coronavirus and, and the uh, shutdowns and everything. We're meeting at the park at 930 on Sunday mornings and it's just casual. We're scattered out there and we have uh, mask and we have hand sanitizer. Everybody needs to bring a chair or a blanket. And we've just been having a great time. It's just been beautiful weather out there for the most part. But if it's not raining, we'll be having the service at 9.30 this Sunday and I want to encourage you to come. We also are, have a group of men that are coming in to be with us for one week and they're coming in this Friday and they'll be, uh, their group's name is Carpenters for Christ. And we have a, a gang of 25 carpenters for Christ and some cooks that are coming along with them. And they're going to be staying down the road at Cherokee Cove. But we're calling on all of our people. If you could help us, we want to supply each man with four water bottles for each day that they're working out there. And that's what we need. So we need a lot of water bottles and we need a lot of individualized snacks whether it's uh, cookies or candies or things like this, individually wrapped because of the coronavirus. We want to make sure that if anybody is making, making or baking anything, that you do it and individually package those so that they can be distributed to the folks that are doing the work. We so appreciate these men who have given up a week of their vacation time to come absolutely at no cost to our church. And we have uh, tradesmen of every construction part uh, uh, that are going to be with us and all. And how we thank God for His blessings and just what God's been up to in our in our life. It's it's awesome. So, church family, uh, bring that by the church office if you would, uh, starting tomorrow all the way through uh, next Tuesday. Uh, we'll be doing it through next Friday. And so, I appreciate it so much. Last week we were talking about the prayers of Elijah and I just want to do it just a little uh, review briefly but we were in the book uh, last week we were in 1 Kings chapter 17 and we're going to just review a moment there and then we're going to turn over to the book of Exodus chapter 32. So in 1 Kings 17 we see that Elijah came on the scene, things were bad, uh, and we talked about how God has warned us not to fall in love with the world around us. He said in the New Testament in the book of James, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves this world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we're constantly challenged by the Lord and through Scripture not to have any other gods before our God. And in Exodus 23, one of the, the Ten Commandments, God's Word says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Elijah went to the root of the problem, and when he was there at Mount Carmel, he said uh, to the people out there who had come, there were several hundreds of the false prophets of false gods, and uh, Elijah said to the people of Israel, Choose ye this day. You know, he said, You've got a choice that you're going to have to make. He said, How long? Taught you between two opinions. He said, you've got to make a choice. And uh, he said, uh, we're going to have uh, a sacrifice time and we're going to call, you guys call on your God and then I will call on my God and the God who answers by fire, letting the fire fall from heaven and burning up his altar and his sacrifice, 
then let him be the true God. And all the people agreed to that. And that's what happened. And Elijah prayed. And we're talking tonight about some of the prayers of Elijah. And uh, Elijah prayed and said, God, I know who you are. And I know, God, that you can do anything. You can do everything. But for the benefit of all these other people who are out here today, God, I want to ask you to let the fire fall from heaven. The other group had tried. They had prayed to their gods all day long and nothing happened. But Elijah prayed and the fire fell. Now, um, Israel had a problem turning aside to other gods. And we're going to come back to that story in just a little bit about the prayers of Elijah. But I want to let you know that all through the scriptures, the, the, the people on planet Earth have had a, a leaning toward getting into sins, bad things, wrong things, immoral things, uh, terrible things. And God warns us in His Word about getting uh, involved in sin. And so uh, I wanted us to see in James 1.8, the Bible says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Matthew 6.24, Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Uh, he'll love one and, and despise the other. He'll cling to the one and hate the other. But uh, Israel had a problem of turning aside to other gods. So uh, I want to ask you about your personal relationship with God. At, most of the time, I, my conversations tend to, if I'm meeting people, talking with people, sooner or later we get around to talking about the Lord. And when I start talking to people about spiritual things, I've often found that people quickly will say, oh, I've done that. I, 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 I prayed a prayer one time. Or I, I went to church. I had an experience at church one time. But guys, I want to tell you that our relationship with God is more than just a moment in time. It's more than just a... It begins there. It begins with us putting our faith and trust in God and accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. But uh, all too often, uh, some of those experiences and some of those things, if not really from the heart and not really from the soul, those things just become almost non-existent. And, and so I want to tell you that the tendency is for us people who live down here on planet Earth is to do the same thing that the Israelites did uh, in, in Elijah's day, the same thing that Moses dealt with and the children of Israel in the wilderness. People turn to other gods. And so uh, if we want to know who our God is, I, I can almost say to people, let's get your calendar out and let's see, you know, what kind of time in your week are you spending with God? Where is God on your priority list of uh, things to do, uh, service to Him, spending time with Him in prayer, studying in the Word of God, studying the Bible, talking to other people about the Lord, investing in fellowship and and encouragement and loving people and helping people and serving God in a uh, Let's take a look at our calendar because through that little calendar book, you can tell a lot about where a person's priorities are. The second little book is our pocketbook or our checkbook. You know, if you get out your checkbook and, and uh, I've heard oftentimes of people said that as they look through their checkbook, they realize that God really had no place in their life. And uh, it's a terrible thing when God is as good to us as He is. And we see that we have not prioritized Him in our lives, in our schedule, in our relationships, in our involvement in ministry and service and attendance in our Bible study or a small group or Sunday school class or things like that. And so I want to ask you, according to that, where would God be in, in your, on your calendar? How much of your time is spent in living for God and serving God and, and, and spending time in prayer and Bible study and sharing your faith? How, how much of your income is, is spent investing in the things of God or is all of it spent on other things that you pick up? Well, Israel had a problem in, and over in the book of Exodus, let's turn over there, Exodus chapter 32 tonight. And uh, Moses had uh, come down out of the mountain there. 
and he where he got the Ten Commandments, chapter 32 and down in verse 1. It says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. Now Aaron was Moses' brother, and Moses had left Aaron in charge while he had to go for those 40 days and 40 nights up into the mountain there. So the people gathered themselves to Moses' brother Aaron, and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which will go before us. For as for this guy Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we, we wot not. We don't know what has become of him. So Aaron said to the people in verse 2, Break off your golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and they brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand. And he fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. He shaped a calf out of it. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation, and he said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. Now the connotation of this text in the original language is that this was not a wholesome, healthy party. Uh, there was a lot of immorality going on. Verse 7, and the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, uh, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Now, they're, they're saying this about... Uh, they're, the God that brought them up out of Egypt was the Lord God of heaven. And now all of a sudden in just one day's time these people are worshiping false gods. Look down in verse 9. The Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, uh, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of his, this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest thine own self, and saidst unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Now listen, you know, uh, you know when, when we see the uh, in indication of other gods, and the, the Israelites there at Mount Carmel, they were looking toward other gods. Uh, they, they, had, they had gone after false gods and false worship. And some of the gods, I just jotted down a few of these gods that I saw, the gods that they had made that came before their loyalty and their allegiance to their Father in heaven. I, I saw the God of personal pleasure, and I saw that many of the Israelites turned away from the one true God and they were seeking out a God who would patronize them in the areas of their own personal pleasure. Uh, I, I see also the God of entertainment. Uh, oftentimes we find, even in our day and time, how the God of entertainment has totally taken over. Uh, there are so many people who once uh, attended church and once were involved. Now listen guys, as a pastor, I, I have said this for years, you know, and I'll say it to you tonight. I want you to know I say this to people. I don't think I don't think church ought to be a drudgery, and I don't think anybody ought to have to go to church and be bored. 
And I want to tell you, if you're going to a church and you 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 just have been going there and and you're not growing in the Lord and you're not you're not learning more about the Lord and you're not you're not, I want to tell you, you might need to find you a church that loves the Lord, preaches the gospel, and teaches the Word of God, where you realize, hey, you know, I feel like I am special here, and I feel like I I love my. My pastor, my pastor loves me. I love the people here. The people love me. And you personally, and, and especially those of you that are raising children, I want to tell you, there's a lot of people, they'll go to church out of a duty for a while. But I want to tell you, if they're not being fed, if they're not being nurtured, if they're not growing in the Lord, if they're not learning spiritual things, if they're not spiritually walking with God, church can become big-time boredom. And it will not do it. And I want to tell you, there's nothing, nothing any worse, I think, than people going to church and being miserable and just dropping out and quitting altogether. Listen, during this pandemic time, I have realized there are a lot of people that have had to pull out of church because of physical conditions, uh, age uh, problems with aging and all. We know that the older people, over 60 and older primarily, are, are prime candidates for this and we understand that but I will tell you there's a lot of people that have stopped going to church there are a lot of businesses that we're going to see have closed down temporarily that will never open up again and I am confident that there are many churches that are not going to be able to withstand what's going to be taking place I want to encourage you today if you know the Lord and love the Lord your church needs you now, I say that to my people here at Bethel. We need you. you need, we need each other. We need fellowship. We need to come together. The Bible says, Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more as you see the day of the Lord getting closer. We need to be in church, and we need to be there with God's people. But these people were so caught up in entertainment. Can I tell you today that every church, every pastor I know of, has difficulty with people who get off on some kick, some hobby, some, uh, if it's hunting or fishing or camping or going to the races or going out, even if it's going out, some people put their family before God and they, they, they rob God's day and they, they take it all a vacation time. They always use God's day to take their vacation time. And I always tell people, you know, God gave us seven days a week. He asked us for one day back. God gives us all 100% of our income, our money. Everything belongs to the Lord. All the money in the world belongs to God. And God only asks that we give back to him 10% in worship of him. And I won't tell you not to do so, God, is robbing God of your time, robbing God of your the investment of giving that day back to God, that day of worship in your life and serving God, and that, that offering that you have to bring. Every time you see people going into God's house, they brought an offering unto the Lord. So it's the God of personal pleasure, the God of entertainment. I see the God of slothfulness. Some people, you know what their God is? Oh, let's just take it easy. They get through eating one meal and they start talking about the next meal. Well, look, where are we going to eat tonight? Where do you want to go out? What are we going to... And their gut food has become people's God today. We have so much, so many people that are... Uh, we talk about all the drugs, but I want to tell you one, one of the biggest problems we have in America today is obesity. And what do we do? We go out and eat, and then we start talking about what our next meal is going to be and this and that. I, I see a God of... Uh, the God of slothfulness where people... Or just taking it easy, take you know, take it. Don't worry about it. Just just relax. Just uh, don't do anything. I see people retire, and I want to tell you, people quit church. They quit work. They quit God. They quit doing anything. And guys, God never made you and me to be like that. And so, I'm calling you. If you're part of the Lord's family, I want to tell you, get back in church and get in and be faithful as soon as the doors can open again in the churches across America and across the world. I'm calling to the church family, the Christian family, if you know the Lord and if you love the Lord. 
you find that place that God wants you to plug in and plant yourself and get in and find a place of ministry. Don't go to church and say, what can this church do for me? You go in and say, what can I do serving God here in this place? The God of disobedience. I believe that there's a lot of people whose God is disobedience. They just, they, they don't do anything that God tells them to. They don't, they're not following any of God's practices. The, the God that allows me to do whatever feels good. Bible says uh, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? A lot of people say, well, I'm just doing what my heart's leading me. Well, don't follow your heart, you know, God. I, I encourage people, follow the Word of God, not your heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Your heart will lead you astray. And uh, so I encourage you, uh, don't let that God block you from doing what God wants you to do. The God that I worship out on the lake or in the woods or at the sporting events or the God of my family that I put my family members before, I, I think that, that I've got to take God's time and everything, my devotion to God, and I just take that and just have time with my family. That's, that's not worship, guys. And I, I'm all for family, and I love family, and I like, but we, we don't need to take from God and, and let our family be our God. And then I think of the God of my choosing. There are a lot of people who's God, who, who choose a God that lets them do what they want to do. I mean, all the, the mess and all the slop. Uh, the Bible, in the Bible, Jesus said in John 10:10, 10, 10, Jesus said, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, but I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Have you ever noticed, guys, that uh, when you get off track and you, you're not, you know you're not doing anything that God wants you to do, isn't it really comfortable to find a God <laughs> that lets you get away with anything you want to do? You can, you can just uh, defile your body in all kinds of ways. You can, you can get out and get caught up in, in drugs and, and addictions and habits and, and wrong places and wrong events. And before long, you know what? Rather than it bothering you, you, you realize you have chosen a, a God that is not a God. It's a, it's a dead, a dead uh, philosophy is all that is. Because there is only one true. God says in Exodus 20, he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I want to just ask you, I know we're talking about prayer at this time, but I want to ask you, have you allowed other gods to come in and rob your loyalty to your God, to the Lord Jesus? Does he know? Are you spending time talking to him every day in prayer? Well, when I think about this, I want us to go back over to 1 Kings because I wanted us just to see there that the people in the wilderness in Exodus chapter 32 and the people in, in 1 Kings where Elijah was uh, dealing with, uh, they all, all of them, they, they, a lot of them had false gods that they were worshiping. But Elijah had some prayers, and the first prayer we looked at last week was the prayer for the healing of the woman's son. You remember we were talking about the woman that you know, she was down to her last little piece of, little bit of meal in a barrel and her last little bit of oil. And Elijah said to her, would you fix me a little cake and let me eat it? And she said, I don't, all I have is, it, uh, I'm just going to cook these last two little biscuits and my son and I are going to lie down and die. And so this woman, God said, I'm sending you to her house and she's going to watch out for you, feed you, take care of you and everything. And I want you to live there until I send you somewhere else. Well, that lady's little boy died. And uh, in 1 Kings 17, and down in verse 17, uh, uh, it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore, so bad, that there was no breath left in him. Now, we talked about this last week. You know the little boy died. And the woman got all upset. She came to Elijah and that those next verses there, she said, is this what your God does? Does he kill? He killed the children uh, and he did it because of my past sins. And Elijah took the boy up in his arms and he took him in there and he prayed to God. God put the spirit of this child back in him again. 
and uh, uh, verse 21, he, Elijah stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, he heard his prayer, and the soul of the child came back into him again, and he revived. Now listen, guys, can I tell you, is there a mama or daddy that's listening tonight? I, I won't tell you, I watched on the news the, the other day, I saw several of our little, uh, most all of them were little African-American children that were being shot and killed. And I see what's taking place in our cities. Guys, can I tell you, every one of us as parents, we know how we love our children. Has something ever happened with one of your kids and you begged God, you prayed to God? I won't tell you, Elijah was in that place. Elijah prayed and the Bible says that God of heaven heard and answered his prayer and put the spirit of life back in that little boy again. Now, I'm just saying, guys, when I'm talking about praying, we're talking about praying during all these weeks. I believe that prayer is one of the most important things in the church of Jesus Christ. We talked about the verse where God says, My house shall be called a house of prayer. The church should be called a house of prayer. There should be praying going on. Listen, people, we talked about how we pray and when to pray and why to pray, but this we know we all got children. We all have loved ones, and I won't tell you when your children get sick and all, and it's your child, it's your family member, you know what I'm talking about. You want to be able to pray like Elijah did and to see God respond with a healing touch. Well, the next prayer was over in 1 Kings 18 and verse 24. And that's where uh, he said, You call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And so uh, uh, in verse 37, uh, Elijah is praying to God. He says, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Verse 38 says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and concerned, uh, consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when that happened, verse 39 said, When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they began to cry out, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. So Elijah was praying to God. He said, God, reveal yourself to people down here on planet Earth. God, let people see who you are. Let them see your hand. God, show yourself real today. Then I think about the third prayer of Elijah in 1 Kings 18. I want to get this in tonight, so we're going to take just a couple of extra minutes. But in uh, 1 Kings 18 and down in verse 41, it says, Elijah said to Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the abundance of rain. And Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees. And you know, when Elijah got down, he began to pray. He was calling on God. It hadn't rained in a long time. And Elijah said, God, we need rain. And God, I'm calling on you because we, we have gotten our people right with you, God. Now we need the rain to come back, Lord. The people have turned back to you. And the Bible says that, uh, it, verse 45, it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Guys, I'm going to tell you, can I tell you that God, our God, is the God who answers the prayers of our needs. The Bible says in over in Philippians chapter 4, the Bible says, My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We see in the prayers of Elijah how he prayed for the little boy. We see how, uh, according to the prayers of Elijah, that he, he uh, healed the little boy and, and he answered by fire and, and he sent the rain. But I want you to see one last prayer. Elijah prayed. And guys, this was the only prayer of Elijah, as far as I know of, this was the only prayer of Elijah that God didn't ever answer. He didn't answer it then and it never did. Look down in uh, 
let's see here, 1 Kings chapter 19, and look down in verse 4. Elijah, uh, when, when this happened, he went himself, the Bible says, one day's journey into the wilderness, and he came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And he said to God, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. And guys, I want to tell you, when somebody starts praying that God will kill them, I will tell you, that's, that's, that's hard business. But do you know that God never, he never killed Elijah? As a matter of fact, Elijah never died. He was one of two men in the Bible that never died. They were just translated into heaven. They just were taken to heaven. Um, the Bible says that Enoch uh, walked with God and was not for God took him in the book of Genesis and over in the, the book of Kings here we see where Elijah was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot escorted by an angel band and you know God to this day <laughs> never answered Elijah's prayer he's never died and, uh, you know, it's, it's a real miracle. But you know what God did? Elijah was feeling bad because he, he thought, he, he thought, and he actually said this. He said, I'm the only one that still loves you, God. I'm the only one serving you. Now, listen, whenever you get in, that, that's, a, that's almost like depression, isn't it? And a lot of people go through times of depression and deep discouragement uh, and, and deep disillusionment. There's a lot of discouraged people and a lot of depressed people. And a lot of people have made that prayer, Lord, if this is what my life's going to be, just kill me right now. But you know what God said to Elijah? He said, Elijah, I've still got work for you to do. And he gave him three assignments down in 1 Kings 19. Look in verse 14. Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with the sword and I even I only am left and they seek my life to take it away and the Lord said unto Elijah go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus and here's the three things in verses 15 and 16 three things Elijah God said I want you to do when you, when you get there anoint Hazel to be the king of, over Syria that's number one number two and anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi shalt thou anoint to be the king over Israel and then he said number three Elisha the son of Shaphat he was kind of like an apprentice or an associate pastor or an associate prophet with Elijah he said I want you to anoint Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola shalt thou anoint to be the prophet in thy room he said you're going to anoint the king of Syria the king of Israel and you're going to anoint Elisha. Now, guys, I won't tell you. Then God came along down in verse 18. He said, oh, Elijah, one more thing, son. He said, I just want you to know this. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. God says, I just don't want you going around worrying, son, that thinking you're the only one that still loves me. He said, I've got 7,000 people in the land of Israel here who have never bowed the knee to Baal. They're my people. Guys, I will tell you, in times of our deepest discouragement, we can still call out to God in prayer, and God hears, and God answers, and God understands. Remember our key verse, God's telephone number, Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. God's people, let's come together. Let's be praying. Let's call on the name of the Lord tonight. God bless you, and thank you for being with us tonight.